Hey guys, Ben from Ben's Game Time here, and well, it's finally here. SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated, one of the most highly anticipated remakes of the last who knows how long. Everyone's excitement for this game has been through the roof, all for one of the greatest licensed games of all time. And the question on everyone's mind is whether or not this game stacks up to the original. I know a lot of people want to know just how good this remake is, but I also think it's important to look back on the original for comparison purposes. So for the people who only want to hear about Rehydrated and the changes it's made, I'll have a timestamp here on screen and in the description below for you to skip to. And for everyone else who wants to hear my thoughts on the original, let's get started. Battle for Bikini Bottom perfectly exemplifies what I think a licensed game should be. And that is a solid, well-made game that acts as a love letter to the material it's based on. Developed by Heavy Iron Studios and released in 2003, the game is a 3D platformer collectathon in the same vein as Mario 64 or Sunshine. The premise of this game is that in his latest scheme to steal the Krabby Patty formula, Plankton invents the Duplicated Tron 3000, a machine that builds an army of robots. Unfortunately for him, the Obey switch was set on the Don't Obey option, causing the robots to kick him out of the chum bucket and setting the robots loose on Bikini Bottom. At the same time as this, Spongebob and Patrick are playing a game of robots and racehorses when they wish for real robots they can play with, with Spongebob eagerly saying, I name mine Robo Jr. or Zorlon or maybe Frankie. Holy shit, is that a One Piece reference? The next day, Spongebob awakens to a robot rampage with all of Bikini Bottom in disarray. Now it is up to Spongebob, Patrick, and Sandy to stop the robots and save Bikini Bottom. This story is great. It's a simple setup that doesn't feel too out of place for a Spongebob game, and you can see this being an actual episode for the show. The gameplay of Battle for Bikini Bottom is phenomenal, and is some of the most fun I've played not just from a licensed game, but from 3D platformer collectathons. Your main goal for this game is to collect golden spatulas, much like the stars of Mario 64. These will unlock new levels and progress you through the game, and there are a hundred in total. Each of the game's nine levels in the hub world have eight to collect through a variety of different challenges. You can also get eight from Mr. Krabs who will trade them to you for increasing amounts of shiny objects, the game's currency, and eight from Patrick for returning his lost socks to him. Shiny objects can be found scattered around the levels, but for the most part are rewarded for defeating robots or destroying tikis. There are five different types of tikis. Normal tikis, floating tikis, explosive thunder tikis that activate when touched but explode instantly when damaged, stone tikis that need to be destroyed via explosion, and sneak tikis that need to be approached quietly to destroy, otherwise they hide. A cool detail of this game is that the game rewards defeating multiple tikis or enemies in rapid succession through comboing. Getting a combo rewards you with extra shiny objects, with better combos giving greater rewards. The socks act as the game's collectibles, and finding 10 will net you a golden spatula. As far as collectibles go, these aren't too bad to find. They are usually out in the open or gotten through smaller challenges, and you can find how many you found in the pause menu. The last four spatulas are rewarded for beating each of the game's major boss fights, and you'll need 75 to enter the chum bucket to face the final boss. In terms of playable characters, you've got Spongebob, Patrick, and Sandy, and each play significantly different from each other. Spongebob is the all-around character, and is the best fighter. His double jump is solid, and he fights using a variety of bubble moves, including swinging his bubble wand, a bubble stomp, and an aerial bubble viking helmet attack for enemies or tikis above him. He is also the only character that can sneak by him walking on his toes, and has exclusive access to moves like the wall jump and the bungee jump. Patrick has the weakest jump and is slow movement speed wise, but has some unique capabilities. He's able to pick up and throw objects, like throw fruit, aka watermelons, freezy fruit, aka ice, and tikis. His ground slam is also able to stun some robots, which he can then pick up and throw, but he has no aerial attack. Patrick is more so a puzzle-solving character than a fighter or jumper, but is by no means terrible in those areas. Sandy is the best jumper and can glide using her lasso. She can also swing from Texas hooks, which are used for a few platforming challenges. Combat-wise, she's not bad. She has no ground slam attack like Spongebob and Patrick, but can attack some robots and tikis from a distance with their lasso. Spongebob is playable in every level, while Patrick and Sandy get half of the levels each, and each character feels like they get used a fair amount. Overall, I like how these characters are designed and these skills are divvied up. Each character is useful for different circumstances, and no one character feels too overpowered. It makes it feel like a real team effort instead of one character being used for almost everything while the others are used only a handful of times. There are also some other smaller details to the gameplay that are pretty cool, and go a long way to making this game a great experience. Each character has access to a slide move, which gets used for downhill slopes. While in a slide, you can just smash into robots and tikis, and the slide is easy to control. What's really nice about the slide is that each character has a different style. 
Sandy just uses a clam board and Patrick slides on his ass, you know, no more ways to slide around. But Spongebob uses his tongue to slide, like a madman. Also a nice detail is how the game implements a warp system. The warps are cardboard boxes, a reference to the Imagination episode, and once you find two boxes for an area you can hop in one to get sent to the other. This is such a fun way to implement this and is very much in tune with the style of Spongebob. Another gameplay element in the Spongebob style is how health is measured. Health is represented by underwear, and you start with three, but this can be extended to six by finding pairs of golden underwear in each section of the overworld, which is kind of funny. The variety of robots you fight in this game is amazing, with the robots having different attack styles and needing different attacks to defeat. Some are melee attackers and will charge at you, while others attack from a distance. Most robots can be defeated with a basic attack, but some require aerial attacks or ground slam attacks. I also love the designs of the robots as they are very creative and unique from each other. I mean, look at this guy. Dude's got a chunk of ham as a hammer. That's pretty wild. However, all of this pales in comparison to the single greatest addition to this game. Take a look. That's right, you can fast travel to any spatula in the game. If you pause the game, you can see what spatulas you've got for each level in the overworld, and you can then just fast travel to a spatula instead of having to walk there from wherever you're at. This detail is so amazing that it makes me upset that it isn't in other games. It is such a convenience and time save, and is something that takes this game above and beyond. The gameplay of Battle for Bikini Bottom does more than really need it to in order to be a solid 3D platformer collectathon, but all the extra effort is much appreciated. The core gameplay of controlling Spongebob, Patrick, and Sandy is amazingly solid, with each character having a different style, but the small details of comboing tikis and enemies, the teleport boxes, the variety in the robots, and just being able to warp to any spatula in the game make it a one-of-a-kind experience. However, that's not all that Battle for Bikini Bottom excels at, as its level design is also amazing. The best way I can describe Battle for Bikini Bottom's level design is that it falls somewhere between Mario 64 and Mario Sunshine, in that the levels are linear, but the golden spatulas are not. Each level consists of four or so sections, and typically loop around or connect in a specific order. The golden spatulas, however, can be completed in any order you choose for the most part. Some spatulas are rewarded for just reaching the end of a section, but most are rewarded for completing specific tasks. A perfect example of this level design is in the game's opening level, Jellyfish Fields. Your main task is to travel to the top of Jellyfish Fields to get some King Jellyfish Jelly for Squidward to treat his jellyfish things with. Along the way, you'll get spatulas for reaching the end of some of the level sections, but you'll also get side tasks including a bungee jump, throwing robots as Patrick to drain a lake, and long jumping to a spatula after a slide. The beauty of this system is that you can grab as many or as little of these spatulas as you want. A spatula giving you too much trouble? You can just skip it. You don't even have to help Squidward, you can just grab some of the side spatulas and go to another level. I think this style of level fits this game well, as it allows each level to try out some different things and be larger, but doesn't overwhelm the player when they first enter a level. Each level is themed to either recurring areas from the show like Jellyfish Fields, Downtown Bikini Bottom, Goo Lagoon, and the Mermelair, or are based on single episode locations like Rock Bottom, the Kelp Forest, and even a level based on the episode where Spongebob enters other characters' dreams. Each level has a unique design to it, both in the aesthetic and gameplay departments. Downtown Bikini Bottom features many twists and turns around the city streets, and then has you platform on top of rooftops. Sand Mountain is a level entirely dedicated to sliding, with three different slides, each with a time trial, and each of the different dreams in the SpongeBob's dream level vary greatly in design and gameplay. Not every level or moment is a hit, which is to be expected. The Murmurler has that infamously tough rolling ball puzzle. Rock Bottom is a bit hit or miss at times, like the museum is cool, but getting there and then the trench of advanced darkness are just kind of meh, and Kelp Forest is my least favorite level in the game, especially the Stone Tiki puzzle. However, the game's levels overall are charming and are a blast to play through, and the game's difficulty is more than fair. The level design of Battle for Bikini Bottom is spectacular. Each level is different enough from the rest that they don't feel repetitive, and it's great to see each of these areas as fleshed out levels. They are just great gameplay-wise and aesthetic-wise. A Battle for Bikini Bottom having amazing gameplay and level design is good and all, and it's enough to make this a great game, but the reason I believe so many hold this game in such high regard, and the reason that this game above all other licensed games and some regular games got a remake, is because this game is so true to its source material. The game is just oozing with the same charm that the Spongebob cartoon has, and it makes the game worthy of the name and worthy of the praise it has received. We've already covered the small callbacks to the show with levels based on specific episodes and gameplay elements like the imagination boxes, 
but it goes much farther than this. Most obviously is that nearly the whole voice cast is present in this game, which is honestly a bit impressive. Like even very minor characters like Larry the Lobster, Mrs. Puff, and even Bubble Buddy have their voice actors return, which is incredible considering a fair number of licensed games don't get the voice cast used for the source material. The only notable exceptions in Battle for Bikini Bottom are sadly Mr. Krabs and Mermaid Man, but the lack of these voices doesn't necessarily detriment the game, it's just noticeable that it isn't them. The game is also funny, with a ton of subtle humor, some of which I didn't catch as a kid. Authorities are not sure who is responsible for unleashing the mechanical menaces, but they have assured us that the person is in big, big trouble. Uh-oh. Did I say big trouble? I meant so enormous that it's hard to comprehend trouble. We'll keep you posted as this tragic story unfolds. Tragically, we're sure. SpongeBob, I'm your friend, right? No, not really. Exactly, and as your non-friend, I worry about you. Like right now, you're thinking too much. I'm worried you might really hurt yourself. Tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna think for you. This way, you won't hurt yourself. And you can just keep working on getting me into the chum bucket. And now, back to your regular programming. Retirement home girls gone wild. The boss fights also have a ton of charm to them, both the level bosses and the major story bosses. Not every level has a boss fight, but the ones that do are a nice touch. Bosses include King Jellyfish, the Flying Dutchman, and the Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy villain, Prawn. Yeah, sadly not Man Ray or the Dirty Bubble, but I'll take it. These bosses operate on a three hit system and aren't all that difficult, but they're still a nice addition. The bosses that are really creative are the major story bosses. Each are based on a playable character and have multiple phases, with the final boss being a robotic version of Plankton. What's also nice about these fights is they take place in iconic locations like the Poseidon and the Industrial Park, with the Fish Newscaster as a ringside commentator. These boss fights are a ton of fun, and beating them rewards you with new moves. Beating Robot Sandy gives you the Bubble Ball, a bubble that you bowl like a bowling ball that also acts as a slight nod to the Band Geeks episode, and defeating Robot Patrick gives you the Cruise Bubble, a remote control bubble missile. These are amazing rewards for completing these boss fights and really make the progress you're making through the game feel more substantial. However, one of the greatest details in this game comes from the theater. The theater is unlocked by spending a whopping 40,000 shiny objects, practically the only time you have to grind shiny objects in the game except for maybe the last few Mr. Krabs spatulas. Unlocking the theater rewards you with a slideshow of concept art for the game, including early designs for the robots, levels, and even artwork for a cut robot Squidward boss. This is an insane addition to the game, and you can even see some of these pictures in the Rock Bottom Museum, along with pictures of Heavy Iron Studios. This is just an amazing extra level of care, which perfectly exemplifies why Battle for Bikini Bottom is such an extraordinary game. It's honestly hard to describe how good Battle for Bikini Bottom is in words. There are only so many ways you can say something is great or incredible or fun, but that's just what this game is. SpongeBob, Patrick, and Sandy all play differently, but none of them are bad, and none are so far better than the others that you'd only use them. The base gameplay is exactly what a 3D platforming collectathon should be. You can collect the specials you want to collect, all of them have equal value to each other, and the addition of being able to just fast travel to any spatula from anywhere in the game is so amazing. The levels may be on the linear side, but they're open-ended enough that they don't feel restrictive, and the references to specific episodes are great, with each level having a unique style. What sets this game apart is that it truly feels like a Spongebob adventure, with all the humor, charm, and love that can be found in the show. It's just a magical combination of gameplay, level design, and charm, and is exactly why this game deserved a remake. So how do those rehydrated compared to the original? Is it better, worse, or around the same? Well, the remake was made by Purple Lamp Studios, not Heavy Iron but the game is pretty much the same as the original. You've got the same story, same levels, and same gameplay as the original Battle for Bikini Bottom, which is a good thing. No need to fix what isn't broken. However, Rehydrated does have a few slight changes here and there, some good and some bad. Let's start with the good. Most obvious is the graphical upgrade. The game is much more colorful, and the new art style is beautiful. In the overworld, you can see some of the levels better, which is cool. Included with this graphical boost are more expressions in cutscenes. Now in the cutscenes and dialogue, characters will emote more and show more emotion, which is a nice extra touch. Also for some cutscenes, characters will hold extra props. For example, in the original when you turn in the steering wheels to Mrs. Puff, Spongebob would claim to have earned his driver's license, but instead it was his library card, but he wouldn't be holding anything. In the remake, Spongebob will now actually hold his library card, which is a sweet addition to the cutscene. There are some other small graphical changes. 
The Rock Bottom Museum paintings were changed from the concept arts and photos of Heavy Iron Studios to parodies of famous works like The Scream, but hey, there's Bold and Brash. The pause menu was also changed slightly. You can still fast travel to any spatula just fine, but now it comes with a colorful map and each spatula comes with a picture of what it is. While from a UI standpoint, I prefer the old version's simple and quick navigation, I also like the cosmetic upgrade of the new pause menu. Audio-wise, the voice lines were ripped from the original, but they still sound good. The voice actors for Mr. Krabs and Mermaid Man are still not in the game, but that's because of how the Union for Voice Actors operates. If they re-recorded the lines for those two characters, they'd have to redo them all, which is understandable. However, some unused voice lines were added in, so at least that's something. Also, the music in the game sounds the same. Apparently, the tracks were remastered to output in stereo instead of the original's mono, but to me, they just sound the same. Like, here's Goo Lagoon from the original. this was from Rehydrated. Now the remake has a few small tweaks to the gameplay that for the most part are either just quality of life changes or are for balancing purposes. One of the biggest changes is how the combos work. In the original the duration of a combo was short, say a second or two. Rehydrated has extended this to be around 3 to 5 seconds in length, which makes it much easier to combo. There also seem to be a few more shiny objects scattered about the levels, which is also nice to cut down on grinding. Another nice change is that the combat is a little more fast paced than the original especially in the boss fights. The original Robot Sandy boss fight had some long pauses between attacks, while now the fight is much faster, with little downtime between attacks, which is a really nice change. Some of the harder challenges were either simplified or made a bit easier. The lifeguard tower puzzle in Goo Lagoon has been simplified so the towers just connect or don't. The false connections have been removed. The rolling ball puzzle in the murmur layer was made much easier with the addition of a left wall on the tilty board part. But the best change has to be that the slide time trials in Sand Mountain and Kelp Forest no longer activate checkpoints, meaning if you fail you just get put back at the top, which is such a quality change. Some basic moves for the characters got slight changes which are weird. The symbol for Spongebob's wall jump was changed, but is much faster. Also for some reason Patrick has got two different ground slams. With one jump it is just a standard ground pound, but off of a double jump it's the slam that can stun enemies, which is a weird addition. Also, Patrick can now attack mid-air, which throws off the balancing a bit, but Sandy can now lasso enemies while in mid-air, so it evens out. But what's even stranger is Sandy's lasso swing on the Texas hooks was changed from automatically holding on to now having you hold the swing button to stay attached with a more automatic swing. This change is just bizarre, and I had to go back to the original and see if maybe I remembered the move wrong. The last change to the base gameplay I noticed was that now there was a dedicated button to sneak with, which is a nice addition to the control scheme. However, not every change made in Rehydrated is an improvement, and there are a few big steps backwards compared to the original. The first issue I have with the remake is that whenever you die, you hit a loading screen. In the original, if you died, you'd just be put back in the game pretty much instantly, but now you have to wait a few seconds. This just baffles me, as while yes, the graphics are better, the game is running on better hardware than the original, so I figured you could get back in the game just as fast. From what I've seen, the PC version seems to respawn you faster, I played the game on a standard Xbox One, not an Xbox One S or X, but it's still disappointing to see the game not run as well as the original. Also, some small details were changed that removes a tiny bit of the game's charm. Like in the original, entering a teleport box would close up the box and the other box would open when you'd pop out, but now it just teleports you. Also, when you put the mustache on Squidward's painting, he no longer says hey, which is disappointing. While having loading screens after death and removing small details like the box animation are annoying, they don't compare to an actual hindrance to the gameplay, that being that the Mr. Krabs spatulas are much more expensive. This change makes no sense, as the original had fair costs for the spatulas. They started at 3000 and increased slowly, with the most expensive being 7500 a reasonable cost. Now they start at 3000 but increased by 3000 each time, all the way up to 24000 That's 108,000 shiny objects you need to buy all the spatulas. This is a ridiculous increase in price, and makes completing the game even more of a grind, especially if you're going for 100%. In the original, you didn't need to grind shiny objects except for the theater and maybe the last Mr. Krabs spatula, but now you have to grind for almost all of them. Speaking of the theater, it makes a return in Rehydrated, and it still costs 40,000 shiny objects. Now, they couldn't use the old concept art again for obvious reasons, but hey, maybe they put something cool in, like a new level, or maybe it's even the cut robot Squidward boss fight. No. It's neither of those things. Instead, it is a slideshow of 10 screenshots from the game, and that's it. What the f***? This is a terrible change. The original theater was so rewarding, if you were dedicated enough to get the shiny objects, you got to see some cool concept art. 
But this... This is nothing. It's less than nothing. I get they couldn't use the original concept art because of legal reasons, and I wasn't expecting them to use the original art, but anything else would have been better than this. The theater is such a letdown and not at all worth the price of admission. Do yourself a favor and don't buy it. Now the last thing that was added into Rehydrated was a two-player multiplayer mode, which is where the Robot Squidward boss can be found. The mode is simply a horde mode where you fight waves of robots, and it's really f***ing boring. You can play as some new characters like Gary, Squidward, Mr. Krabs, and Robot Plankton, but overall, this game mode is just dull. You just respawn after you die, and it doesn't seem like you can lose at this mode, and if both you and your partner die, you just restart the wave you're on. You don't even directly fight the Robot Squidward, you just destroy one of its tentacles when you complete a section. I played a handful of matches, and each time my co-op partner left the game. That's how boring it is. It's nice that they included it, but I don't think I'll be playing it again anytime soon. Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated is a game of small changes. There are some really good changes, the graphical upgrade is nice along with the new added details, and the small additions to the gameplay like the sneak button and reworking some of the harder puzzles are great too. But there are some bizarre changes like giving Patrick two different ground slams or changing how you swing on the Texas hooks with Sandy, not to mention the removal of small details like the imagination box is shutting or Squidward saying hey. But the loading screens after death the theater no longer being worth the purchase, and especially the increase in price for the Mr. Crab spatulas bring down my enjoyment of this game. I'm not going to hold the lackluster multiplayer against it, as it was something extra that wasn't in the original, but for the most part this game is exactly the same as the original, just with small tweaks, some good and some bad. I'd say both versions are valid ways to experience the game, and that for a casual playthrough, Rehydrated is a tad better because of the simplification of some of the harder puzzles, but the original is better for a 100% playthrough by a long shot thanks to the increased prices of those Mr. Crab specials. But overall, when you compare these two games with pretty much the same gameplay, but with additional charm and a less grindy completion, I'd say the original is slightly better than the remake. I'd give the original Battle for Bikini Bottom 96 golden spatulas out of 100, while I would give Rehydrated, I don't know, 90 golden spatulas out of 100? The additional grind for Mr. Krabs and the worsening of the theater are just that much of a drag for me, but Rehydrated is by no means a bad game, and I'd highly recommend Battle for Bikini Bottom as a must-play game, original or Rehydrated.